Yeah, well, we're going to get started momentarily. Just really quickly, all, ad all attendees are on mute, um, but if you, there will be time for questions towards the end. So we can unmute you if you want to ask a question or if you, if you want to add to the conversation, we, we can navigate that towards the end, um, but we're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone um, to our back to school policy briefing on the student health index and advancing equity for through school-based health centers. I'm really excited today to share more information about the Student Health Index and the role of school-based health centers throughout California. My name is Lisa Eisenberg, and I'm the Policy Director with the California School-Based Health Alliance, or um, acronym is CSHA. Really quickly before we get started, I wanted to do some, uh, a little quick housekeeping. We are recording the webinar right now. Um, everyone besides the panelists are muted, but we are recording the webinar and then the PowerPoint presentation as well as the recording will be shared after later this week after the webinar is concluded. And then I also encourage you to post questions or comments in the chat. They, there will be time at the end of the presentation where we can answer questions. And with that, I'm um, really excited to introduce you to our first speaker who will help us frame the need for reimagining children's well-being through school. Um, Alex Bris Briscoe is the principal of the California Children's Trust which is a statewide initiative really doing just that, reimagining the systems and the roles of, of uh, reimagining the roles of systems to address student well-being. Um, so we've worked really closely with Alex in his role as uh, the director of the Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency. Um, and in that role, he um, oversaw an expansion of the county's school-based health centers, which he will speak to. Um, he has also come, comes from working in school-based health centers. He, he worked as the director of a school-based health center in West Oakland. And as I mentioned to somebody earlier this week, once you're a school-based health center advocate, you're always a school-based health center advocate. So with that, um, I'm mm -hmm. going to turn it over to Alex and um, pass control to the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome everyone. Um, it's true. I feel like um, I was born in this movement and would love to see it scale. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And maybe we could all begin with, um, you know, a hope or a vision that someday in the near not so distant future, there's a school-based health center in every school the same way there's a gym and a library. Because we have learned some really amazing and important lessons about how critical and essential it is to support the social, emotional, and physical health of children in schools. I am clicking, but it's not moving, Lisa. I think we're we're in a frozen moment. So we'll give it one more second. But if not, you'll have to take it back over. There we go. <clears throat> Seems to be working. So um, as we talk, lead into this question about school-based health centers and efforts to scale them in California's schools and healthcare system, it's important to note that we are in a crisis. And it happened before COVID. So while lots of us are talking about the social and emotional wealth of health of children right now, um, we are now in whatever you call a crisis that you poured a bunch of gasoline on and lit on fire. Because before COVID, in the decade before COVID, we saw a 104% increase in hospital admissions for self-injury. We saw a 50% increase in mental health hospital days. We, young people themselves were telling us when we surveyed them through the California Healthy Kids Survey that they needed more than they were getting and unfortunately, we rank 48th in the nation in access to needed mental health care. So, man, that's um, despite our progressive rhetoric, we are really far behind. And COVID did exactly what you thought it was going to do. Uh, like I said, poured gasoline, lit it on fire. We saw far more children in the emergency departments, an increase in children younger and younger. And in fact, we now know that one in four young people 18 to 24 also considered self-injury or self-harm. One more click, Lisa, and I'll show you some one more horrible piece of data. Um, when this piece of data on the right-hand side of the screen appears, it will tell you that um, when you look at the entirety of crisis service utilization, 
in the handful of level one pediatric trauma centers, including Rady Children's Hospital, you'll see a 1700% increase in kids' utilization. So something's going on, right? Like, I think we can all say at this point that if you aren't concerned about the social and emotional welfare of children, you aren't alive, you're not, you're not thinking. And whether it is 400 years of structural inequality, whether it is social media becoming available on mobile platforms, whether it is a perpetual and extremist news cycle that provides images and content that is not appropriate, development appropriate for children, we have created a witch's brew of challenge for young people that school-based health centers are uniquely positioned to help address and support. Um, there comes the box I was reporting to. If you wanted to know sort of overall 10 month to 10 month comparison, pre and post pandemic, we saw 34% fewer mental health services during that same period of time in, uh, pre pandemic. Um, so one thing we learned is when you close schools, you shut off really important sources of care for children and young people. And one of the reasons that schools are so important is that traditional medical models will not work meaning 75% of mental illness manifests during the time when children use doctors the least, right? The traditional system in our healthcare system is like, you go to the PCP, you get referred, and then you go see a service. That type of PCP gatekeeper role simply doesn't work for the most important service in young people's lives. The three leading causes of death for children are homicide, suicide, and injury. In fact, suicide leapfrogged car wrecks and cancer as a cause of death over the last 15 years. So we don't have enough PCPs. We don't, young people won't seek the services they need through this way. And frankly, we've been overdiagnosing and pathologizing children to justify services for them. And how do we get here? We don't have a common framework. Our systems are fragmented and challenged. We aren't really clear whether mental health is an essential benefit in a healthcare package or a public health service. And we really have messed up this thing called medical necessity, meaning how to get access to care. I have literally billed hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, Medi-Cal services in California. And 80 to 90% of the children and families I served were not mentally ill, though I had to give them a diagnosis to get paid. They were dealing with really difficult challenges in their lives. Dad getting arrested, challenges in their home, sleeping in a car. Those are the things that were impacting their social and emotional development, not some kind of pathology. So we have to reorient our not systems, meaning put services where kids are in schools, because that's when they need them most, but also the way we identify young people for service and resist this pathologizing of young people that is an unfortunate outcome of our traditional healthcare model system. So schools, as I mentioned, must and can be essential actors at scale. The healthcare needs system schools to need, need schools. To my point, you can't access young people at the time you need the most unless you do it in schools. And the finances align, this is super, super important, everybody. And I know, I'm not sure everybody here is a Medicaid geek like me, but Medicaid is this huge payer. In fact, it covers almost seven out of 10 children in public schools. And the actual mechanism for cleaning it is aided by schools. Remember, no-shows are the primary driver of medical losses. If Johnny's not there, Jimmy is. So you can almost eliminate no-shows as a loss leader. But it's also some financing considerations, meaning the dollars that schools use are eligible for federal matching funds in the Medicaid program. So just to give you a little taste of the power of this work, and um, I don't mean to say we got it, had it all figured out in Alameda County, but between 2000 and 2015, over about a 15 year period where I was both a clinician and then a system leader, we more than doubled the number of children getting a mental health service. And a huge part of this was our expansion of school-based health centers. In 1996, there was only four of them. In 2000, there was eight. In 2004, there was 12. In 2008, there was 14. In 2010, there was 19. In 2012, there was 26. In 2014, there was 29. And today, there's not only 29 school-based health centers, but over 200 school-based mental health programs. The point I'm making here is that there can be scaling when flexible resources are used to prime the pump and careful financing strategies are used to sustain it. And when we resist the urge to medicalize all the support that young people need. The financing was super complex and that's why we need new models of financing. This is how we did it in Alameda County and if it makes your brain go numb, it should. It took a team of oh, somewhere between 25 full-time people just doing the backroom finance work. So to pass it off to the rest of my amazing speakers today, we have a once in a generation opportunity to address the crisis. If we have the courage 
to center schools in a response at scale, specifically centering a school-based health center model. But when we do it, we have to reimagine these services, not simply as medical services, but as social justice services. Young people are in a social justice movement. They're in a survival game to protect their social and emotional health. We have to leverage that wisdom and intelligence, that resistance, and do it with the support of adult allies in clinical settings. We have to understand and navigate the nexus of public health and public education. That's what school-based health centers do. They arrive on campus, they provide some clinical services, but they also help redefine how health and education can work together for the benefit of both systems. We have to partner with community-based providers of mental health and medical services. And there is a unique opportunity now to spend one-time dollars to prime that pump while we ensure that Medicaid and other funding streams can sustainably support these essential services. With that, I'll pass it off to Lisa. I guess I, I will end with this. This can and should be done. Uh, it was done in some jurisdictions. There's other jurisdictions that have had success with the school-based health center model. There's close to 300 of them statewide, but there really should be close to 3,000 um, or more. So uh, with that, Lisa, thank you. Sorry about this. Thank you for your patience while we uh, <laughs> manage our remote control sharing. Thank you. Um, give me a second. Okay, I think we're back on. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, for framing this conversation for us and um, offering your inspiration and wisdom. Um, again, thank you uh, uh, for getting us started. Um, if you don't know me, again, my name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm with the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth. And we do this by advocating for and supporting a network of school-based health centers across the state. So. We've talked a lot about school-based health centers already. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar, at least initially with the model, but if you are not, you're probably asking yourself, what is a school-based health center? So school-based health centers are small clinics located on or very near K through 12 school campuses. Most school-based health centers deliver primary health care through such as physical exams and immunizations through licensed medical providers. And this is often in really close collaboration and coordination with the school or school nurses. Um, they also provide a spectrum of other health services. So most commonly they provide behavioral health services. Um, they also provide dental or oral health care in some settings and optometry and vision care. And then they, provide a wealth of other programming that supports a young person's comprehensive health care. And this is often around youth development practices. So most school-based health centers um, deliver peer health education, peer counseling, many have youth advisory boards, and many school-based health centers reach beyond the clinic walls into the school community to deliver school-wide health promotion and activities. Um, School-based health centers are focused on delivering care for the students at that school or in that school district, but many also provide care for family members, for siblings, sometimes for the teachers on that school campus, and um, many provide care for community members at large. And the best school-based health centers are integrated with the school community, so they work really closely with their school partners, coach um, teachers and school staff on addressing uh, students that may be experiencing trauma, that maybe have other health conditions um, that show up in the school community and in the classrooms. This is a little bit more information about school-based health centers. 
most school-based health centers in California are in secondary school settings, and a majority are operated by community health centers known as federally qualified health centers. Although there are many, many arrangements across the state. Um, and funding for school-based health center comes mainly from Medi-Cal reimbursement, government and foundation grants, and in-kind support from partners, schools, and school districts. And um, because California does not have dedicated funding for school-based health centers, it can be very hard to find funding to continuously operate these centers. A lot of what goes into running these centers is not completely coverable through the Medi-Cal reimbursement that they draw down. So, you know, we know that there's need. We all know that students need to be healthy to learn at their full potential. We know that there are gaps in access to healthcare that impact a young person's ability to show up to school ready to learn. Um, and I think we've seen multiple studies that have document, documented the role that school-based health centers play in reducing equity gap for students. Um, there's actually a recently a new article um, from the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics that documents this well, and we can link to that article in the chat. But these are the three main tenets, main benefits that we think school-based health centers provide to addressing school-based health care and student health needs. So the first one is that they create easy and safe access to comprehensive health services in a safe, familiar, and trusted location, their schools. So students that also typically don't utilize traditional healthcare settings like that in the community um, have been pro, and, and those that have low utilization like adolescents, um, they have, it has been shown that accessing care through a school-based health center actually improves utilization, improves access to care, particularly for some hard to reach communities like young men of color and LGBTQ students. I think the second tenet value of school-based health center is that they provide integrated health care that is really focused on the prevention and early intervention around health issues, really understanding that there is a need to screen young people early, engage them early, you know, even when they are seem to be very healthy, that this is an important tenet of creating long lasting health. Um, so school based health centers are also linked often linked to community based providers in that they so that they can coordinate a young person's prevention and early intervention care with um, needed through managing that young person's health care in the school site and off school site. And then the third component of the school-based health center model is that they focus on the whole child. Um, I, I've, I've mentioned that they provide an array of health services, but they also address some of the, the, the non-clinical care that goes into a young person's healthy needs. Um, so they address behavioral, physical, oral, and other aspects of a young person's health. And they also um, connect young students to caring adults on campus um, and engage young people in their own health care, in their own leadership. Um, and so they are really an approach to addressing a comprehensive need of health for young people. Here's a map of where the current 293 school-based health centers are in California. Most of them are concentrated in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego counties, um, although we have actually seen a huge movement and tremendous growth in the Central Valley um, in the past decade. So we've seen a lot of growth, growth there as well where there is, where there is substantial need. Um, by design, school-based health centers are located in areas where students face challenges related to many social determinants of health, such as economic insecurity, immigration, structural racism, environmental health threats, transportation, and many, many other barriers to health care. Um, only fewer than 
300,000 California students attend a school with a school-based health center. And so we at CSHA and with our network of school-based health centers and advocates want to see that number increase. We know that there is data getting at the need for more students to have access to health care. And so, and so we think that school-based health centers are really an avenue to, to address some of the unmet need. The gap between the 300 students that have 300,000 students that have access to school-based health center and the millions of students that are in California. And so we developed the Student Health Index, which I will talk about momentarily, um, to really pinpoint the precise areas where we think that school-based health centers are the most critical for student well-being. So I've talked a little bit about school-based health centers and really the best way to understand the impact of school-based health centers is to hear about them from the young people that use them and the young at heart people who work in them. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce you to two more guest speakers um, who have deep experience working in and supporting advocacy for school health. So first to speak will be Irma Rosa Vieira, who is a former member of our our organization's youth board, and she is currently our youth engagement associate. associate. Irma attended a school with a school-based health center in her hometown in Los Angeles and has been a unique and fierce advocate for school-based health care ever since. After Irma will speak, then um, Kalila Banks-Ruffin will speak, and she is a physician's assistant and director of school-based health care for Clinica Sierra Vista a community health center in serving the Central Valley. Um, she has practiced pediatric medicine for 14 years and provided health care for adolescents in the school-based health care setting for the past 10 years. And she is currently the primary medical provider at one of the school-based health centers in the Central Valley that I've actually had the pleasure of tour touring um, and visiting. And it has, it's a school-based health center that has been deeply imprinted in my mind as, as one of the really great school-based health centers that we have um, at Rutherford B. Gaston Middle School. So Irma will speak first and then Kalila Banks will follow and then I will come back and really dive down into the student health index. So it's my great honor to welcome Irma first. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I was going to say, I hope you guys are enjoying the weather, but like the weather this week has just flip flopped back and forth. I don't even know how to dress anymore at this point, um, but I hope you're all doing well. And I first just want to thank um, CSHA for letting me come on and um, kind of speak about my story. And also to Alex for also providing all that um, really useful information. Um, it definitely gave me the chills because it was such a like an... Um, we know the work that needs to be done, but it's sometimes like we forget just how much work still needs to be done. But hopefully, you know, by the time that we finish here, you're all uh, leave being inspired. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, my name is Irma Rosa Viera, um, and I grew up here in LA, and I actually went to a school in Los Angeles called Elizabeth Learning Center, and it was actually um, not your average school because it was actually pre-K to 12th grade and then we even have adult school. Um, so we actually got to see and experience the Wellness Center as a kid um, very early on in elementary and then in middle school and then also working extremely closely with the Wellness Center in high school and onwards in college. Um, uh, I just also want to say that you know, everything that Alex mentioned with the need that is happening um, right now for our youth in school is definitely, um, it's definitely real. And the story that I want to share was how I came into contact with wellness centers for the first time. Um, as um, Lisa knows a bit of my story and um, sorry if you hear some background noise, but um, when I was in elementary, um, my family had already came here a few years since then from El Salvador, and um, my whole family was able to come except my grandparents, and one day we got the news that my grandparents 
parents were being, um, they were going to be held hostage. And you can just imagine that as a kid in elementary, you're trying to worry about, you know, what kind of friends you want to make and, you know, middle school is about to start. Um, so mental health and was not a priority in my mind until then. And at that point, you know, I didn't have any resources. I didn't know who to look to because at home, um, my parents told us not to tell anybody else because they wanted to solve the issue. Um, so after that, I just remember my mental health going really bad because we didn't have the money to pay for my grandparents to be safe. And I remember it started to affect a lot of my education um, because I'm somebody that loves school and I'm always raising my hand. But suddenly, you know, my my teacher noticed that there was a change in me. Um, and if it wasn't for her asking me how I was, I wouldn't have broken down in class that day. And um, I honestly owe her so, so much because when she realized that I wasn't okay, you know, she talked to my parents, but what she did was so much more than that. She ended up actually creating um, a little group in our wellness center. Um, and it was a lot of different kids that go, that were able to go and actually confident, like, I don't want to say it felt like a secret club because all of you knew that everything that you were going to see was going to stay in there. Um, and basically everyone was talking about the things that they couldn't talk about at recess. Um, and at that point in my life, I had no idea that the place I was in was the wellness center. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, I stayed there from elementary, middle school and high school. And it wasn't until I went to um, middle school, I knew that there was a wellness center, but it wasn't until high school when I joined the club and I was actually helping to, um, support and um, increase attention to all the resources that the wellness center had that I remember I walked in and my little brain was like I remember crying in this room but like happy tears because I was getting the help that I needed um, back then and my family was getting like a lot of help um, so it was a beautiful like um, circle of life kind of thing so from very early on I was very privileged to understand the huge impact that wellness centers plays um, on a lot of students that are fortunate to receive um, access to wellness centers and you know just hearing Alex mention all the amount of percentages that have gone up in need um that was what really gave me the chills because I start to think you know what if I didn't have that wellness center on campus what if that teacher hadn't known what to do um I definitely think it would have changed the course of my life so I'm always here to be able to advocate for wellness centers and the change that it has made because I'm just one person and I know it changed my entire life so that I, so I know that um, the work that you are all continuing to support is doing just the same for so many other students. Um, and what I also want to say, what I also want to highlight is in conjunction with what Alex said that there is such a huge need and in conjunction with um, my story where I, I really do believe that having access to a wellness center changed um, the trajectory of my life. You know, it just means that, you know, we need, we really do need to continue to support the wellness centers. And thankfully with the index that Lisa will be talking about later, more students will be able to gain access to a support system that is um, very dire in need. And I also just wanna thank everyone for being here and being able to advocate for students that are not able to be in this space, but wish they could. Um, and with that, I just thank everyone, and I want to welcome our next speaker, Kalila. Thank you. Hello. I don't know. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Um, so, yeah, like Lisa introduced me, uh, my name is Kalila Banks, and um, I've been working in school-based healthcare for the past 10 years. I initially started. Um, with lifelong medical care in Alameda County. Um, I was the provider when they initially opened West Oakland Middle School's school-based health center and um, the school-based health center that is on the Elmhurst campus, um, which is a middle school uh, in East Oakland. And um, about ooh, seven years ago now, I moved to Fresno um, to be part of the uh, inaugural opening of Fresno Unified School-Based Health Center here at Gaston Middle School. And this is where I've been ever since. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I first want to say how much I appreciate what Alex shared, what Irma shared in regards to the importance of school-based health care, um, the impact that we're able to make in the lives of young people, especially in the realm of um, mental health and addressing mental health needs. 
and addressing health disparities. Um, I'm going to emphasize a little bit more um, on some other aspects, positive aspects of having a school-based health center um, available to young people and being able to, to reach them where they're at, you know, because we do kind of have this situation of um, what I like to call a, 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 a permanent population, a pool of potential patients. So when you have students on campus, it makes it much easier to reach them. So it's not even so much just access for them to reach us, but also access for, for us to reach them. And um, one of the things that I think really benefits young people with being able to come here to the health center and when they see that it's actually like a medical office, the way their faces look, and you know, they're very curious um, and amazed. They, but, and I think it also makes them feel good, like, oh, this is really for us. You know, we wanna make sure that we advocate for them and show them that this space is meant for them to use. And in, in our um, situation here at Gaston, we are open to the community as well. So we do pediatric patients um, from the age of 19 and younger um, from the community as well, not just students from on campus, but we do wanna make sure that we prioritize the young people here at the school and make sure that they realize that this space was designed for them and meant for them. And one of the really um, interesting things that I've seen happen with young people coming to the school-based health center is that they learn how to better navigate the um, healthcare system and advocate for themselves. When you're used to going to, you know, your sporadic medical appointments with your parent, your parent's usually the one who's there and who speaks for you. Um, a lot of times when you are working with primary medical providers who maybe are not around young people all day, every day, the um, the relationship and the their, their method of communicating with young people is not always in the best interest of the young person. And so when we have young people here who um, get used to the idea of coming into an appointment on their own, being able to advocate for themselves, being able to give a health history for themselves, um, understanding like what medications they take and their dosing, um, knowing what pharmacy that what pharmacy their parents go to, it's really really impressive. I think that it's um, a good thing to have that expectation of our young people to to know that there is some autonomy, you know, over their own health, over the decisions that are being made in regards to their health and to their bodies. And I think it encourages them to continue to follow through with, you know, making healthy decisions, whether that be, you know, in regards to their physical health, their mental health. Um, I think also as a school-based health center, being able to interact with the school and the school district on a youth engagement level, we're able to see young people embrace the idea of like total wellness, not just focusing on their physical wellness, but also the wellness of their communities and um, being invested in the well being of their community in general, whether that means um, food insecurity, um, access to green spaces, uh, economic wellness. There's just so many things that, with us just physically being here on campus. Um, we're able to work together to make sure that we're addressing the entire child. So we're not just here to be able to provide their physicals or their sports physicals or, or even their vaccines. We're here to help them grow into their full potential and to be, um, you know, to reach adulthood and, and to be, to have the most positive experience in childhood that we, we can help them to have. Um, I also feel like being on a school uh, being on a school campus is helpful for young people just in being able to have um, access to the to the space and seeing what uh, employment in healthcare looks like and just knowing that those options are there. A lot of times, um, and not all all not all school based health centers are are in low income communities, but a lot of them are. And like 
Alex mentioned earlier, um, the majority of the patients that we see uh, are medical patients. And so allowing them to have access in, in a comfortable space where they feel like they can ask questions about what it is that we do, um, what it's like to, to work in healthcare, how we got to the positions that we got to, and, um, and, and feeling comfortable because you can go, you can have a pediatrician your whole entire life and you might see them every year or you know every few months, but when you have access to your medical provider and um, medical staff on a regular basis, a daily basis where you can just stop in. We have young people who just stop in to say hello. We have young people who just stop in to get water. I think that what we're providing them with is uh, an opportunity for so much more. And so I, I think that school-based health centers are great. So um, yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you so much, Kalila and Irma, for uh, giving us your insights. Um, I really can't say it any better. So I appreciate, I always appreciate being able to share, share the stories with the youth and the practitioners that um, are doing this work on the ground. So thank you again to both of you. So with that, I'm gonna hopefully move us along um, and really dive into what the Student Health Index is. So the Student Health Index is the first statewide comprehensive analysis to identify the counties, districts, and schools where new school-based health centers will have the greatest return on investment for improving student health and education equity. So uh, you've heard, had a chance to learn about the school-based health center model, hear what they look like on the ground, and how communities, schools, and students benefit from school-based health centers. So why the Student Health Index? So I mentioned earlier that there are 293 school-based health centers, but more than 10,000 schools in California. So despite really transformative school-based health center success on the ground, they're still not as widespread as we know they should be. And I think in large part, this is because there's been a lack of investment in California for school-based health centers. California is one of only 15 states that doesn't provide funding for school-based health centers. Um, and we actually have one of the largest number of school-based health centers. So um, I think, you know, we are behind a, a number of states that do provide funding on an ongoing basis for their school-based health centers. So the goal of the index was to identify the districts and counties where there is the greatest need to address young people's health and education outcomes. And these are things we know that research tells us school-based health centers can provide. So the index is here to both provide the evidence of the need for more school-based health centers and really pinpoint the areas where a targeted investment could be made. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the methodology. I am a data geek, <laughs> like Alex is a Medi-Cal financing geek. So I could really dive into this and I'm, I'm going to spare you that a little bit. But if you're, in, if you're interested, you can reach out to me directly and you can also check out our full report on the index, which goes through a lot more of the methodology. But generally, the Student Health Index is a one-of-a-kind research that combines the 12 indicators of health and educational outcomes that you are seeing on your screen into one score or one need score for every school that we included in the analysis. And these 12 indicators were used because they get at the outcomes and benefits that research shows that school-based health centers address. So based on how actual school sites are doing across these 12 indicators, each school in our analysis ends up with a designation of either highest need, higher need, lower need, and lowest needs. And so those are four categories, highest need being the highest need for a school-based health center on that site. So we included health and healthcare indicators and socioeconomic indicators that were available at the census tract level and we, in, we included school indicators that are inva available at the school, um, school level. Um, and the full report 
provides a description of each indicator included and the rationale for its included inclusion in the calculation. You have probably noticed that even with a huge focus on student behavioral health on this presentation and at the state at large, we did not include an indicator that gets at student behavioral health needs. We, I want to assure you we wanted to include one, both because we know that there is a great unaddressed need to, for school-based behavioral health services, and we know school-based health centers improve access to behavioral health support. But unfortunately, we could not identify a behavioral health indicator that was publicly available across the state and geographically specific enough to be meaningful in the calculation. So there are a number of county level indicators. So we even tried um, mental health related hospitalization rates um, as a possible indicator. But there, all these indicators are only available at the county level. And when we tried to include them in the analysis, it just it didn't make much of a difference in terms of uh, need scores for the schools. Um, so we were unable to include a behavioral health indicator. And I do think it's at least momentarily acknowledging um, that this information isn't available statewide. Um, there's really great information that you can pull at a school site level and a district level that I, I don't wanna ignore, but we don't have something that's available statewide that can really get at the differences within counties. Um, and as our state is making huge investments and really focused on school-based behavioral health, I, I at least want to briefly acknowledge that I think this is an unfortunate lack, um, unfortunate gap in our data. So, uh, Moving quickly on, I want to make sure that there's time for questions at the end, um, but I really want to cover some of the three findings, um, the three core findings that we found in our analysis. The first one is that the student health index shows where to invest in school based health centers for the greatest impact on student health and learning. So we have an index as well as a dashboard, which I will show you very shortly, which provi provides decision makers with easy to access information about where to invest in new school-based health centers. So on your slide, you can see a screenshot of um, the dashboard and each dot, each school in our analysis is assigned a color-coded dot need score of um, from highest to lowest. So the red dots are the highest need schools and the light blue dots are the lowest need schools. Perhaps unsurprisingly, our analysis also showed us that our highest need schools are concentrated in particular areas in the state. So there are counties and districts with significant levels of unmet need. You can see a map on your screen of the top 10 counties that have 10 or more schools that are that with the highest need designation. And so it's a ratio of the highest need schools to total schools in that county. So those are the, the top 10 counties with the highest concentration of high need, highest need schools. And then similarly, this is a look at school districts. So these are the top 10 school districts in the state that have the highest concentration of highest need schools to total number of schools in their district. So as an example, Linwood Unified has five total schools that were included in our analysis, and all five of those have the highest need designation, so they have the highest concentration. And again, these districts are even concentrated in particular areas. Three are in San Bernardino, San Bernardino County, excuse me, and three are in the Central Valley. And the third and final finding that I wanted to just highlight for you all um, is that is also probably unsurprising. Our highest need schools serve significantly more low income students and students of color than lower need schools. So specifically, the index found that highest need schools were schools on average where 89% of students were eligible for free and reduced price meals and 91% of students were students of color. And this is compared to lowest need schools where only 23% of students are eligible for 
free and reduced price meals and 60% are students of color. So I think this really highlights and underscore, underscores that an investment in school-based health centers is a way to address some of the equity concerns and disparities among communities that we know exists across California. So um, I'm actually running, I'm, we're close on time, so I'm not going to take a moment to show you this dashboard, um, but I will, I'm happy to follow up there. It's a publicly accessible mapping data where you can explore the actual schools and how they how they show up on our analysis. And there are filters on the right hand side of the screen where you can look at particular districts, you can look at particular counties, you can filter out if schools have a school based health center or not, you can change the enrollment of the school size, and you can look at particular particular areas of 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 the of California and, and where these schools are. And again, the red dots on this map are those schools that have a designation of highest need and the light blue dots are the schools with a de designation of lowest need. And so those are color categorized and you can actually explore particular areas. And I definitely encourage you to play around with it um, as, as, you, as you want. And these are links to a bunch of helpful documents, um, including a user guide. So if you open up the mapping tool and you are lost, we do have a user guide that can help you walk through what kind of information you can glean from the dashboard. And again, we will share a copy of these slides after um, later, later this week. So uh, I know we are close to time, but I do want to just say that given all of that, the benefit of school-based health centers, the need for more, I wanted to cover some of the state policies that past, current, and future that could impact and support school-based health centers moving forward. So I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background and history about school-based health centers as a way of grounding us. Um, school-based school -based health centers actually started um, with the passage of SB 620, which created the Healthy Start program in 1991. And many of today's school-based health centers uh, were actually started as Healthy Start sites. And um, so we, we have our grounding in that, in that program as well. But specific to school-based health centers, in 2006, AB 2560 was passed and signed by Governor Schwarzenegger. And this bill created the Public School Health Center Support Program in state statute. And then quickly following that, SB 564 was passed and signed in 2008, which created, which added to the Public School Health Center's support program by setting up a grant program for school-based health centers um, for planning, for facilities and construction and for sustainability. This slide goes into a little bit more detail about what was included in each of those bills, as well as the citation for the health and safety code, where if you want to learn more, you can learn more. Um, but the first bill set up the public school health center support program to provide technical assistance. Um, and this would be in the Department of Public Health. Um, this is very similar to what other states have. Other states have school-based health center program offices in their maternal and child health or Department of Public Health units. Um, and then the second bill added the grant programs for planning, construction, and sustainability. Both of these components were never implemented. There has never been funding provided through the state budget to support this program office with one small caveat and to support grant funds for school-based health centers. Um, and as I mentioned, both bills establish the infrastructure and support for school-based health centers that many other states in, in, across the country have and provide for their school-based health centers. So going back to our timeline, just to build out the history of, of policies in California, um, this isn't specific to our state, but in 2011 and 2012, 
as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, there was $200 million included for school-based health centers, school-based health center facilities and expansion. Our state of California actually received the largest portion of this funding. We saw $30 million in federal HRSA grants go to support more than 70 new school-based health centers in the state. And um, if you look at the increase in school-based health centers in your state, you can actually really see that this is this coincides with a large uptick in the number of school-based health centers in our state. Um, the following two points that I want to say are certainly not isolated to this year. Since the passage of the two bills in 2006 and 2008, CSHA has been doing lots of advocacy to, to see funding for these school-based health center programs included in the state budget. But we did finally see a little bit of momentum in, in this arena um, in 2014 when $3 million was included in the assembly side of the budget. Um, the money didn't make it through budget conference committee, um, but we did see a little bit of momentum move, uh, move slightly for school-based health centers at, on the state budget level. And then in 2016, we saw one-time funding included in the budget for two two-year positions at the California Department of Public Health as a way to sort of start the program office that we legislated back in 2006. Um, and to, 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 to currently, Sorry, the department has continued to support these at least one staff person at the Department of Public Health to, to, to sustain some of their support for school based health centers. Um, so that was the past. This is the present. So these are the current opportunities for school based health centers that we um, are advocating at the state regard. Uh, we are doing implementation advocacy at the state around, as well as working with our network to support locally. I'm not going to go through them one by one. I feel like that in and of itself is its own webinar. Um, but I do just want to acknowledge that these are current investments that, and current opportunities that are coming through at the state level that, that we are acknowledging, are excited about and are engaged in and watching and, and see opportunities for school-based health centers in each of these. Um, I do wanna acknowledge though that despite school-based health center success on the ground, none of these opportunities are specific to or really focus on school-based health centers. Some of them mention school-based health centers by name, but none of them really really acknowledge the role of school-based health centers um, as central to delivering on student health. Um, so I do think, um, I do want to acknowledge and appreciate these investments and, and at least let you all know as policymakers and as, as staff at the state level know that we are engaging our network around these opportunities because we do see that there are benefits to our school-based health centers. And with a little bit of time I have left, I do want to look toward the future and plant some seeds for you all and hopefully plant some seeds for some for, few, few further conversations. So I think this leads me to what, what we see as school-based health centers needing to build and to expand and to grow. And the first one is really around the, the public school health center support program and statute. A lot has changed around school-based health center practices and operations. A lot of what we know work, that works has changed in the last 15 years. So I do think the language would benefit from updating and improving and getting rid of old citations and, uh, and updating what we know are the current needs and definitions of school-based health centers. And part of that I think could also include a stronger definition of what a school-based health center is in statute. So that's the first category. Um, I think the second category is around addressing some of the services for privately insured and out of network students, um, particularly around behavioral health net needs. I don't think this need is specific to school-based health centers. Um, by design, school-based health centers and all school health programs 
don't function like a typical healthcare setting. They serve any, they serve all the patients that are in the school community. They don't just serve the patients that are assigned to them or the patients that take the bus to go see them in their community setting. So school-based health centers serve all students and this can get particularly challenging. And this, I know this has been illuminated in a number of bills that have worked its way through um, the legislature, but it can be particularly challenging to serve privately insured um, or students that are assigned to another healthcare provider. And I, I know that this is intention, this is intention with with what we want to see work in healthcare and how we want to create health counts and medical homes for, for our, particularly our, our, for all of our population. And I think as we are doubling down on schools as a way to deliver care to young people, we do have to sort of navigate this tension and, and come up with some solutions on how to support access through school, school-based programs for all students. And then the last, thing is finally school-based health centers need dedicated state funding to grow and to meet the needs of their students. I think this includes one-time funding for planning and construction and ongoing funding for operations. And I, I know both are a tough sell or a tough ask. And I know in particular, the latter for ongoing funding is particularly a tough sell in California. But I think if you and we do this all the time. If you're to ask any school-based health center, what is one of what is the one thing they need from the state? Um, it's sustainable funding to fully cover the comprehensive programs that they are delivering for young people in the community and in schools. So I know that's a lot. I know that that's a whirlwind. Um, my email address is on your screen. I encourage you to reach out um, and stay connected. Visit our website. I know that there were a lot of links shared in the chat. And again, I will follow up with you all with information from the PowerPoint. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you to Alex and Irma and Kalila for um, helping frame and um, talk about school-based health centers. I know we are um, almost at one o'clock, so I appreciate you sticking uh, with us. And I am going to stop sharing the slides and I am happy to stick around um, and answer any questions. And also appreciate you if you need to hop off and get to your next thing, um, we can definitely do that as well.